Welcome to the sayings of Jesus. In today's message, I will build my church. Dr. McLuhan explores the question Jesus asked that revealed his true identity and mission. Today, we'll explore one of the most important questions Jesus asked his disciples. Remember, when Jesus asks you a question, he's not looking for information. He already knows. He's just wanting you to know more. Divine questions lead us into a deeper understanding of the nature of God. Today's learning experience begins with a walk that starts in the town of Bethsaida and ended over 40 miles later at Mount Hermon. And in between, Jesus made a critical stop with his disciples at a town called Caesarea Philippi. Jesus and his disciples had been ministering in the Decapolis region where many Gentiles were healed, including a man who had a stammer, stuttering speech. He was deaf and he stuttered and he was healed of both of those. Now, not long after that, they returned to Bethsaida and this is the hometown of Philip, Andrew, and Peter. No doubt they visited with family and they had a few days of rest. And while they were there, the people brought a man to Jesus who was blind and asked Jesus to heal him. This is such an interesting story. It is interesting to note that Jesus took the man by his hand and led him out of the town. I think he belonged somewhere else and he wanted that man to go home immediately and tell his family what God, what Jesus had done for him. Now, what is interesting about this miracle is that the man's healing came in two phases. Jesus touched the man and asked him if he could see anything. And let me encourage you, whenever you pray for people, ask if there's any change. It encourages faith and expectation. And this is how the man replied. I see men walking like trees. What an interesting uh, observation. And so Jesus prayed for him again. You see, his sight was partially restored. And Jesus touched the man's eyes a second time, and his sight was completely restored. And the man said, I can see all things clearly. <laughs> this is one of the great lines in the book of Mark. Now, these two miracles that I've just mentioned, the man who was deaf and stuttered, and this man uh, who had this partial healing or, or this two-phase healing, we only find these stories in the Gospel of Mark. And that's one of the reasons I started in the Gospel of Mark to get this connection. Because, because this partial healing has a purpose to it. But before I share what that purpose is with you, I just want to say, if you're suffering with blindness right now, I command your eyes to open. We prayed for a young boy who had partial cornea, and his cornea grew by the grace of God. Ears, eyes be opened right now in the name of Jesus. Deaf ears hear right now in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're just reading my lips, or maybe you're reading the subtitles underneath the text, and you're in the, in the hearing or in the seeing of my words, be healed right now. And if you have a speech impediment or somebody in your family has a speech impediment, we release freedom to your tongue. Be loosed now in the name of Jesus and speak clearly. If you just had a touch from the Lord, please write to me and tell me what Jesus has just done for you. Now, the story of the man for whom Jesus prayed twice sets the stage for the learning experience that the disciples were about to have with Jesus. You see, the disciples only had partial understanding of who Jesus is. And by the end of this journey, their eyes will be fully opened to who Jesus is. Well, I mentioned to you that the man came out of the city gate. And uh, this is Jesus took the man by the hand out of the gate. This is the gate of Bethesda. Can you imagine Jesus walking with this man? And do you see the trees there? Not those, but the ones that were there before. I see men like trees walking. Isn't that interesting? Now, he also goes out of this gate with his disciples. Jesus went out along with his disciples 
to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. So Caesarea was the capital there, and then there were many uh, other villages right there. Uh, and, and so they visited the villages along the way. Let's stop at some of them. So the disciples headed north on the road that leads to Mount Hermon and eventually to Damascus all the way in Syria. And the first village they came to is Chorazin. You may be familiar with this town. It's one of three towns, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin, where the, Jesus did the majority of his miracles. Remember, if these miracles had been done in other towns, they would have repented. And so he passed the synagogue. This is a place of many miracles. From there, they went further up into the mountains to a town called Hazor or Hatzor, as it's known today. This is the fortified city. And this is the main gate leading into the city. Interestingly, when Sennacherib, back in uh, B.C., 700 years before Christ, uh, this is when the northern kingdom fell when this city was attacked. From there, they went on to the city of Dan. And those people that you can see down in the distance are at the city gate. I'm pointing out these gates to you uh, for some purpose. Now, Dan was a very sad city because... Uh, uh, for must have been sad for Jesus because this is where the, the northern kingdom turned away from the God of Israel and said, this is the golden calf and this is, where the, this is the actual altar where they offered this, go, this calf and said, this calf brought you out of Israel or out of Egypt. And so this was one of the cities that fell because of their rebellion against the God of Israel when they turned away from him. A little bit further on is this beautiful waterfall on the Jordan River. I've stopped here a number of times and I'm sure Jesus stopped with his disciples to take a fresh drink of water from the waterfall and just to enjoy the scenery because not far from here is Caesarea Philippi. And so finally they come to this ancient town called Caesarea Philippi. It was the kingdom of Herod Philip. This is Antipas's brother. Uh, there were four tetrarchs and this is where his territory was. And in those days, right out of this cave that you're seeing flowed the Jordan River. And you can see it right down there in the bottom of the screen. You can see where the water is flowing still to this day. Now, this was a place of ancient pagan worship. And in this place, they worshiped the Greek god Pan. Pan was half a man and half a goat, if you know anything about Greek mythology. It was a place of extremely important worship. And where these people are standing, Herod... Uh, uh, Philip, uh, Philip Herod built a temple made out of pure marble to the god Pan. And when Jesus came in there and began to talk to the people about who he is, it was in the face of one of the great religious centers of the old world. And so right there, Jesus begins to have a deeper conversation to, uh, a deeper conversation with the men about who he is. So the walk from Bethesda or Bethsaida to Caesarea Philippi was about 30 miles. And we read this expression, on the way, which is used by Mark many, many times. Now, I don't know if you figured this out or not, but discipleship very seldom happens just on Sunday morning. It happens on the way. So I always like to take people with me wherever I go, and we have conversations on the way about faith in Jesus. It's the best way to talk with your children on the way, bring up a conversation. And so on the way, Jesus was having a conversation. It wasn't just one question. It was a whole slew of questions. We just get down to the, part, the most significant part by the time they arrive at Caesarea. So he's bringing them to the highest point of training in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And he's preparing them to discover who he really is. And so on the way, we read Mark chapter 8 and verse 27. He, uh, way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do the people say that I am? Some say, You're John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 14. Like the people that back then, People today have many questions about who Jesus is. Some see him merely as a historic figure. Some people don't even believe he was a historic figure. Rome's filled with the history of Jesus. If you don't believe he was God, at least believe that he was a historical figure. 
Some see him through the eyes of what's now called the Jesus Seminar, a very liberal view, saying, uh, putting, piecing different things together and explaining away all of the miracles. For a short period of time, some people following Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, and his view of Jesus, um, <laughs> when The Da Vinci Code made the New York Times a bestseller, everybody got excited. Let me tell you, bestsellers come and go. The New York Times bestseller list. Bible is always the number one book in the world. It's the bestseller forever. Don't worry about these books that show up and fade, and that's it. Da Vinci Code was one of them. Some think that Jesus was a great moral, moral person, great character, and a great teacher. Many Hindus might have that view of Jesus. But Jesus pressed his disciples on not what the people think, but what they think. And Jesus is interested in everyone's opinion about who he is. Who do you say Jesus is? This is the most important question you will ever ask. And the sooner you ask it, the better. And I hope you ask it before you stand before God himself in heaven. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. Now, Peter was not always known for his brilliance, but at this moment, he gave the most brilliant and the best answer to the question that Jesus asked. It stirred everyone's thinking to contemplate what Peter had just said. Now, Christ is the Greek word meaning anointed one. In Hebrew, it is the word for, the word for anointed one is Messiah. And so Christ and Messiah are the same word, the same person. This is exactly the same word, incidentally, that the Quran uses to refer to the son of Mary. Read the Quran to you. It's called Al Imran. It's the third Al Imran. It's the third chapter or surah of the Quran and the 45th ayat. O oh, Miriam, surely Allah gives you good news with the word from him of one whose name is Messiah. It's actually in the Quran, that word. Isa, son of Miriam, worthy of regard in this world and thereafter, and of those who are made near to Allah. This Quran verse clearly says that Isa is one of the ways to get near to Allah in their view. The Arabic name for Jesus is Isa, and quite often you hear people say Isa Masih, which simply means Jesus Messiah. It's the same word. Prophet Isaiah used as he described Messiah 700 years before Jesus was born and 1,400 years before the Quran was written. Peter's eyes were opened to see the true identity of Jesus. And Jesus said this to him, blessed are you. When your eyes get opened to see who Jesus is, you have the blessing of heaven upon your life. Blessed are you. Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He's the great revealer. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17. Understanding who Jesus is comes to us as a gift from God by an act of the Holy Spirit. If you have questions about who Jesus is, ask the Spirit of God to open your eyes to see him as Messiah. And people ask me about who he is all the time. Uh, and I simply say, I could tell you the words, but only the Spirit of God can give you understanding to what I'm saying. Jesus made a remarkable statement to Peter. Peter had correctly identified who Jesus is. He is more than a prophet. He is God in the flesh. And Jesus is now ready for the first time to re reveal his mission to his followers. They didn't understand why he'd come, not really. They thought he'd come to uh, heal people and to le lead Israel into being a physical kingdom and, and a great era was coming. They didn't understand what his real mission was. And so uh, Jesus says this to Peter. I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. This is a powerful res uh, revelation and statement about Jesus' mission. He is 
the builder of the church. The pastor is not the builder of the church. The people are not the builder of the church. It is the gathering of everyone who have placed their faith in Jesus for salvation. Jesus is the builder of that church. Now, after Jesus returned to heaven, people gathered in the open air and in homes as when they worshiped the Lord. And for the first 300 years, there were no congregations had a building whatsoever of their own. There was no such thing as a building. Uh, buildings are a blessing, and buildings, are, well, you know how much we've spent to try to keep this building from falling down. <laughs> uh, the countries with the fastest growing followers of Jesus are not allowed to have buildings where people gather. It is not necessary to have a building for Jesus to be worshiped and for Jesus to build his church. <laughs> I'm thinking about places like China and Iran where the, where the growth of Jesus' church, he's growing it explosively in the face of all the odds. Everything that hell is throwing against those believers is not having any effect or slowing down the spread of the message. Jesus is building. He's building a church, not a physical building, but a spiritual tabernacle filled with people who move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Healing and miracles are common. They're just commonplace in churches like these that I have just described to you. It's what changed my view about healing. Seeing what God is doing in churches without buildings where people totally trust him. There are no medical clinics to run to. There's no doctor in sight. They live way out. Jesus is healing people just like he did and he's not limited to those remote places. Now today, we're celebrating 76 years of ministry in this congregation. For the first 13 years, this congregation did not own a building. Met in houses and rented spaces and different areas. And God blessed us with the construction and dedicated the campus that we are sitting in right now in 1958. And for all of those years now, we have been blessed to have this facility and the responsibility to maintain it and use it for the purposes of the kingdom of God. From this place, from this building, with our hands laid upon them and prayed over people, people from this congregation have traveled to more than 100 countries spreading the gospel of Jesus. I'm so glad all of my children who were raised in this church by this Sunday school and by our teachers and by Awana, all of them have been overseas spreading the message of Jesus. What a blessing. Many of your children have gone as well to different places around the world. Thousands of people have come to know Jesus through the ministry of this expression of the local church of Jesus Christ. And now, through our media, every single day, People come to know Jesus. What a blessing. This is indeed a lighthouse. I remember some older members used to talk about this being a lighthouse to the world, a lighthouse to the community. And and I don't think when we were talking about it in those days, we had any idea we'd be seen on 78 million devices. What a blessing to propagate the gospel from week to week right from this very podium and from this very room. Uh, The church Jesus is building is a gathering of everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus for salvation. Jesus said that nothing can stop the church he is building, not even hell can do that. And Jesus declared the gates of hell will not prevail. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, the gates of hell or the gates in the Bible symbolize power and authority. And I hope it did not miss you that I showed pictures of the gates of these major cities along the way. It was at the gates where the elders met and handed down decisions. And Jesus said, the gates of hell are no match for the courts of heaven. And the courts of heaven easily override all that the enemy tries to throw at us and tries to trip us up. No matter what hell throws at you, throws at the followers of Jesus. Heaven has more than enough resources in the storehouses of heaven to meet the challenge of whatever the devil wants to throw in our lives. Satan meant for evil. Satan came to rob, kill, and destroy, and Jesus came to give life and give it more abundantly. 
Before Jesus could build his church, listen to pastor, he first needed to save his church. And Paul identified, after Peter identified who Jesus is, Jesus announced the purpose of his first coming, of his mission. We read that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's the name he called himself, by the way. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. That was a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecies. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. In Matthew we read, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, must suffer many things, and from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. And in the very next chapter of Mark, we read, he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he has been killed, will rise on the third day, Mark chapter 9 and verse 31. So three times Jesus clearly told his disciples that his first mission was to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. This is why the central part of the book of Mark is, is, is written around this key verse, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It's a good verse to memorize out of Mark chapter uh, out of the Gospel of Mark. He gave his life a ransom for many. Clearly, the first mission of Jesus was to pay for the sins of the people of the world. And while Jesus wanted people to know who he was, people ask me from time to time who I think Muhammad is. And when people ask me that, I usually say, I believe what Hamad, Muhammad said about himself in the Quran. This is what he said. I'm nothing new amongst the prophets. What will happen to me and to my followers, I do not know. I'm only a plain warner. And this is in Asura 46, uh, uh, the 46th chapter. It's also known as Dunes or Hills. And the verse number or ayat is number nine. Now, Muhammad claimed only to be an ordinary prophet and openly said he did not know what would happen to him or his followers. There is no comparison between Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus knew exactly what would happen to him and where he was going. Now, some people didn't like what he said. Most people didn't like what he said. But you can't say he wasn't clear at least three times, and there are other references to this. He said, I will be arrested, I will be killed, I will be in the grave, and three days later, I will rise again. Now, some people react just like Peter did. Mark says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine? Mark chapter 8 and verse 32, and Matthew makes it even clearer. Peter said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 22. It's really unwise to tell God what his plan should be. <laughs> I've met many people who think just like Peter. They think the crucifixion of Jesus should never have happened. But listen to what Jesus said to Peter. Turning around and seeing the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the interests of God, but on man's. Mark chapter 8, verse 32 and 33. One translation of the Bible puts it this way. You have no idea how God works. And churches today desperately need members who know how to set their mind on God's interests. Paul taught the first disciples these important principles. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. Well, they all seek their own interest and not those of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 
and verse 21. I pray that you are seeking the interests of Christ and his kingdom and the church that he is building and pursuing what his goals, plans, and purposes are. Well, how do we seek the interests of God? Jesus said, follow me, trust me, and honor me. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and 35. Today an invitation is being extended to you to follow Jesus. Jesus said, not only follow me, you can trust me. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Trust Jesus and trust in your resources. Trust Jesus. That's what he said. And finally, he said, honor me. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory with his Father and the holy angels. Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Oh, I just encourage you not to be ashamed of Jesus or ashamed of the gospel. Just declare it boldly and clearly as we are proclaiming it today. Now, Jesus clearly stated that his mission on the first time that he came to earth, he knew what he came to do. It was to pay for the sins of the church that he was about to rescue. And Jesus also knew what his final mission would be when he returned to earth the second time. Muslims are very clear Jesus is coming back. He is coming back, but with a very different purpose. He was about to give some of his disciples a preview of his second coming. Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. And so now they're making their way up in this journey. Remember I said we started in Bethesda and we will end on Mount Hermon. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and the brothers, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. Most scholars believe this is the mountain to which uh, Jesus is, uh, took the disciples. Just at the foot of this is where they have been at Banyas at uh, Caesarea Philippi. They didn't have to walk far, maybe six more miles, just to actually begin to climb up the ridge. This is, the, this is Mount Hermon in the summer. In the winter, it's covered with snow, and you can go skiing there. <laughs> Sometime I'd like to try to go skiing there. Now, while they were there, behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9, verse 30 and 31. In advance of the most difficult time during his earthly journey, Father God sent Moses and Elijah to strengthen Jesus. They were talking with Jesus about his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension back to heaven. Moses and Elijah represented the words of the law and the prophet that Jesus was about to fulfill. Neither Moses nor Elijah had died a natural death. Moses and Elijah represented moving in power and authority. Moses represented the authority of God through the staff that he carried and Elijah represented the power of God through the mantle that he wore. And Jesus is releasing a church full of people, a generation of people who know how to walk in power, release his power in people's lives. And while they spoke, Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. I love that interesting little expression added. Mark chapter 9 Verse uh, 2 and 3. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Luke chapter 9 and verse 34. What a glorious representation this is of that cloud that may have come upon them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Mark chapter 9 
and verse 35, or Luke chapter 9 and verse 35. This is the second of three times that people heard the audible voice of God identifying Jesus as his son. I so often say to people who ask me about this, I didn't call Jesus the son of God. God called him the son of God. The best thing that we can do is to learn to listen for the voice of Jesus and obey him. I urge you today to walk in the ways of Jesus. Perhaps like Peter, your eyes have been opened to see who Jesus is. Accept him. Accept that Jesus died for you in your place on the cross and that you can spend eternity with God in heaven. Thank Jesus for dying for you on the cross and ask him to forgive you for all of your sins that you have committed. If you just received Jesus as your Savior, write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Next week, we'll continue learning from the sayings of Jesus. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.